Hello and welcome to Show Studios Coach Autumn Winter 24 Women's Wear Panel. I am editor Hetty Malik and I'm joined by a fabulous host panelist today. Um, I want to start by asking you guys to introduce yourself. Maybe we'll work backwards. So Nell, could you start? Sure. Hi, I'm Nell. Uh, I'm the CEO of a company called Zydrobe. Hi, I'm Joshua Graham and I'm the fashion features editor here at Show Studio. Hi, I'm Dillis Williams. I'm the director at Centre for Sustainable Fashion. Hi, I'm Rianne Sinclair Phillips, and I'm the founder of Form Creative. Thank you so much, guys, for all joining me. Um, so, Coach's kind of tail end of New York Fashion Week, one of the biggest pulls um, for the city. Um, and I wanted to kind of start with a simple but loaded question, um, which is, do we think that Coach is a cool brand, kind of going into this conversation? Because um, last season, the creative director, Stuart Vivas, did his kind of... 10 year anniversary show and he's really turned the brand around over the last kind of decade it's I think a lot of people see this and we'll talk about this as kind of a Gen Z facing brand and it's definitely I think a brand that's been focused on becoming cool um, mm. but kind of starting this chat what do you guys think if I ask you is it a cool brand do you think it's cool I don't think it is. I think it's inherently American itself. If I'm thinking about American cool brands, you think about Marc Jacobs' Heaven, which mm -hmm. is so much tied to a subculture, whereas Stuart is always doing an O to a subculture, but it's not cool. It's, yeah, it's not rooted in the people who actually are part mm. and move that culture. Mm. So I wouldn't call it a cool brand. I'd call it a, a commercial American brand with nice pieces. Mm. Interesting. Mm. What about you guys? Um, I get what you're saying, absolutely. But I think there's lots of dimensions of cool. Mm. And thinking about Stuart and the role of designer, mm. I do think that by engaging your customers in what you want to do, the whole kind of beta thing of co-creation is a good thing. And I think that's a kind of uh, more expansive way about thinking of design. Mm. I think there's elements of Cootopia that has made being resourceful, actually quite stylish. And I think some of the Cotopia um, pieces are actually sometimes a bit stronger mm. than some of the main line. Mm. Could you tell people what Cotopia is, just for people watching them might not know? Yeah, so it is the line that's almost kind of responded to the feedback about the, the fact that fashion is exploitative and extractive and they should be cherishing things. So they are making uh, new pieces out of existing pieces. I mean, they were called out about burning uh, stock, which mm. obviously was like some a big lesson to learn. Mm -hmm. And they, so they kind of responded and were like, okay, we're going to show that we, we care, we're cherishing the, the materials, we're caring about the people. So they've got a new line that uh, is very specifically about being resourceful, about being responsible, uh, but also being, being kind of stylish with it. So, um, and they've got Aditi Mayer, who is amazing, because they're ambassador. So, they, so that element is uh, kind of quite strong in making a statement about the importance of that. Mm -hmm. So those elements, I think, are important. But from an aesthetic perspective, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that opens like quite an interesting discussion, which I want to pull from all of your kind of backgrounds and specialisms on is the idea of what does make something cool and what, who is the consumer and what matters to that consumer. Because I think if we stick to start with on that kind of sustainability angle, do we think kind of sustainable and, and environmental values are important to that kind of younger consumer? And does that reflect kind of coaches' target audience with trying to be cool as meeting that? We were just, we were actually just having a, a pre-discussion about that because I think that the Gen Z customer that they're so clearly trying to sort of target with a lot of their initiatives they're doing with the digital strategy as well and also all of the sustainability with Coachtopia is a customer that I'm very well aware of whenever I see it on social media and I see it represented in what they're doing but um, I don't know this person I don't see this person around me and so that could just be me and, and my sort of immediate circle and also the fact that we're not in America, like we were talking about, you know, being in London is quite a different consumer mm. um, to the American market, which is obviously what this brand is rooted in. Um, I think there's a lot to be said about what is cool to that particular customer. And, you know, I think sustainability, they're doing a, they're doing a great job 
with it. And they're obviously trying to work very hard to create some initiatives that speak very, very literally to mm. it. Um, but yeah, the aesthetic kind of angle of the brand is something that I'm, abs I'm not super clear on. I understand they're trying to achieve something yeah. with the initiatives, but in terms of the aesthetic, yeah. I mean, it's interesting that that even has to be like a branded strategy, mm. that it's not just yeah. intrinsic, that mm. it's like branded and kind of, I mean, Josh, what are your like initial thoughts on it being cool? I think that the idea of branded strategy just immediately makes it so uncool, right? <laughs> I think for me, cool comes from an effortless yet provocative mm. kind of boundary pushing, but not necessarily having to be archaic or any of that. I want Coach to be cool. I can see what Stuart has been doing in the last 10 years and trying to really elevate um, a distinct vision of Americana. But I think it's funneled through such a commercial lens and there's mm. such, a, such a goal that's obvious, which is mm. selling mm. Um, and selling to the Midwest American demographic whose ideas of fashion and coolness I think are completely different to our London perceptions of fashion and coolness, and even a New Yorker's perception of fashion. Um, I think a lot about kind of the young brands in New York at the moment, like Luar and Sandy Liang, who are tapping into my idea of cool, or New York's mm -hmm. idea of cool, and it's vastly different to what Stuart's doing at Coach. Mm -hmm. Do we think maybe that, that's made me think a bit about maybe Coach and that strategy is about tapping into that part of the luxury market, which is kind of that Gen Z consumer who wants to buy into luxury, can't afford a Chanel bag. You know, those brands mm -hmm. are upping their prices every single year. Mm -hmm. Kind of Coach has always been seen as having a very high um, quality mm -hmm. um, of fabric. So maybe, maybe it's about that kind of filling that space and maybe it is just unapologetically to create luxury product and maybe that isn't necessarily cool but I mean it seems to be working. I think it's missing the gag though if you think about Gen Z they love a gag mm. so with this collection you look at it and straight away you think of Gossip Girl. The gag I was gonna say in. exactly yeah. so I was saying yeah. the Gossip Girl reboot if you watch that show you would want to wear this. Yeah. It's a collection <laughs> so the gag would have been okay you had the cast in the show you had the younger cast maybe yeah. be part of the yeah. casting <clears throat> it just seemed like such a missed opportunity and with them trying to be cool where's the gag? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah it needs to be entertaining mm. it's just sell 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 that's how I interpret and how then, I I think good. back to my kind of understanding of cool. And for me, cool is like always, there's a level of pushing something, mm. of provocation, mm. right? It's, it's um, a way of being, seeing, living mm. that challenges the current zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. I think that's always cool. And I don't think anything Stuart's done since he's joined coach has really done that. Mm. I think he's really great at looking at contemporary fashion and what's going on around him and funneling that through his very commercial lens and mm. creating collections that are really appealing. I think a lot of these clothes are really appealing mm. and they're gonna appeal to a, a fashion forward younger demographic. But I don't think it's pushing a conversation in any direction. Mm. And what you say about uh, the idea of being provocative, you know, it's, it feels very reactive mm -hmm. to what they think that the customer wants rather than anticipatory of mm -hmm. what that customer might look like, might be thinking about in the future. So it's not something that the customer hasn't seen. It's something the customer's going to be very comfortable with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe from a commercial perspective, when we were talking about this, uh, that's great. But you get to a point where from being acceptable, it suddenly becomes invisible so the coach has been through this before mm -hmm. where it kind of went on a rise and then then kind of disappeared so I think yeah you you have to take risks in order to mm -hmm. be in a good place because it's actually a risk not to take risks mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's no risks being taken here I can see mm -hmm. I mean I think it's worth noting you know we've spoken a bit about the quality being kind of this high luxury mm -hmm. kind of but accessible point and I think it's worth talking about accessories with coach because that's really the sell point mm -hmm. like the tabby bag all of the kind of cushion pillow bag mm -hmm. all of the celebrities that they've got to face those campaigns like JLo 
it's, I think, what I want to talk about a bit is kind of in terms of like the accessory is actually the main thing. Like I went onto the coach website earlier and you're just faced with bags mm -hmm. and that's mostly what's on their Instagram as well. It's not actually the collection. So I'm quite interested in what you guys think about the actual role of having a show and a collection to create this story. But then like a lot of brands really, mm. what you actually are selling from that is kind of the bags. Like I don't think the Gen Z consumer is rushing to buy a dress or one of these taffeta skirts, they're mm. going to rush and buy the tabby bag or the new kind of big tote that they did at this collection. Mm. Um, but what, what, do you, what do you guys think about kind of the runway show as a tool of storytelling? And maybe we can talk a bit about the other strategies like their campaigns and stuff, which have been really, really successful in making this more cool. Mm. <laughs> I but think it places it. Sorry, to no, no, no. it places it in a particular lifestyle, so you can see somewhat the person that they're appealing to. In a way, I think Bali has always struggled. Bali, you know them for their accessories, but they've never quite got the ready-to-wear right. Mm -hmm. Whereas Coach, they have the ready-to-wear right. They have the accessories. It's just not cool. Yeah. Okay. From my perspective, so you need to see it in that. Yeah. You in need... that context. Mm. And you need the theatre of it. Mm. As yeah, well. that's what yeah. I was going to say. That. They've got great bags, and they and he's an accessories designer. Mm. He's got awards for, for that. In that case, why not be kind of out there with the collection? Because you don't even need to sell it. So you t turn it into a theatre. <laughs> turn it into something that's yeah. mad and fabulous because you are using it as a means to sell something else. So I think that that would have given more license mm. to be more, much more provocative. But then does there need to be spectacle, or does it need to, like, do the clothes really need to go there if the consumer sees this and sees themselves mm. as these models in these clothes just to go buy the bag? Do you think the consumer of Coach, though, is engaging with this show? Do you know what I mean? Like, um, when you compare that with, like, the campaigns and, you know, Nala, I want to ask you what you think about some of their kind of more virtual activations like they did an AR mm. filter a couple of years ago to kind of engage more. And they've got a great TikTok strategy. Like, mm. I just find it interesting that you know, especially to your point, Dillis, that this is quite pragmatic, paired back clothing, but does that actually engage the Gen Z consumer with the story of it all? It feels like, um, it, from my perspective, it feels like when a brand does a show, it's sort of something to be taken seriously. And so I understand that they're probably thinking about this not only as like a storytelling place, because whenever there's a brand doing any kind of activation, it's always about how we're going to story tell who we are. How are we going to, how are we going to talk about our DNA in an interesting way that's going to further illustrate worlds around bestsellers, you know, like their tabby bag. And so I do think there's a place for it, um, regardless of whether or not someone's looking, like the customer who buys the tabby, mm. tabby bag is actually looking at the show. Um, but I think that's, it's so inherent into any luxury brand is the DNA in their world and how they're going to bring someone into that world, whether that's through a show, whether that's through um, an AR activation. And it's interesting because nine times out of 10, there's often a conversation about actually what the value of that was on the other side of the activation. So I'm not sure whether there's they might be looking at, OK, does the show actually bring us much value on the other side? Or does it actually just, as a front-loaded activity, deliver us what we really want, which is something that looks serious, you know, it mm. makes them look like a to give it that real status. brand. Yeah, exactly. But it's also part of the institution of Fashion Week. Yeah, the CFDA. Exactly, yeah. So, for instance, if Coach didn't show, you'd think, oh, my gosh, what's happening with the schedule? Mm. Similarly, in London, if Burberry didn't show, you'd think, what's going on? Like, you, we, you need that theatre. Yeah. You need mm. those names to still make Fashion Week still feel, mm. feel quite credible. Yeah. Mm. But I also, you know, the, the activations that they have done around AR and all of those kinds of things, bringing people into a world which I think what I, what I picked up on throughout all of the kind of the looking at the brand that I have done is, is it's a lot about their accessories and a lot about their tabby bags and all of that stuff. And it is all about worlds that they're trying to build to bring people, that customer, further in. And I think it's then the means at which that they're trying to deliver that on lots of different consumer levels. You know, the person who's at the show watching the show isn't the same person who's probably going to be using the AR filter. 
in their store, for example, um, but it's communicating the same message, which is kind of interesting. How effective do we think world building kind of is in coaches' strategy kind of I think it's interesting to also think about some of those kind of AR digital activations, which so many brands lent into in mm. the COVID period and have maybe moved away from and reflected back to just going back to kind of the, the normal schedule. Like, how do we, do we think that what Coach is doing is effective, kind of their whole brand strategy, thinking about campaigns and everything around the show? <laughs> I feel like you have thoughts. I, I think it works from a commercial perspective. I, I, for me, I just look at Coach and I'm like, so American, wrapped in consumerism. So we're going to do these campaigns. Is the casting necessarily right? I don't actually think it is, but it's clearly selling in America. Mm. So the activations that support them, I, I just, I don't think it makes any difference to them as long as they're getting that bottom line. Yeah. And they're incredibly profitable as I a think brand. It, I mm. think it's all leading up to that bottom line. I think if, the, if this show was shit, <laughs> if it was the nappest thing we've ever seen, um, people would know that. People in fashion, or should know that. The Vogue's, the publications, the editors should know that. But because it's so clean, safe, and fashion-leaning, mm. um, these editors mm. will engage with it, the readers will engage with it, and therefore the consumer will engage with it. It's not naff, mm. it's not hideous, it's not pretending to be fashion. Mm. It's so rooted in mm. fashion today that it's almost hard to criticize the actual collection. Yeah, mm. but, I think that's, <laughs> but I think that makes us all need to question what we're talking about with yeah. fashion because if we're saying there's nothing that is uh, going to make us feel upset or nothing that's going to make mm. us feel as if it's wrong, that means it's right. Well, not necessarily, actually. We should be questioning why this is, this is what is being said and being shown to, to Gen Z at a time when actually fashion should be making a real statement. I mean, there's other statements being made at New York Fashion Week and political debates mm. going on instead of shows. And you've got the, the week opening with Marc Jacobs, incredible theater mm. and the, the kind of skill in that. So I think we should be questioning whether this is acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that because it isn't provocative in any way, that that, that means it, it, it isn't really what we're looking for in fashion. I mean, I haven't read any reviews, so I don't know mm. how the editors are, are responding. How, how has it gone down? I think it's gone down pretty just vanilla and well as it always does every season. It's, There's it's, never anything controversial to talk about, it's really. Like, mm. It's one of those brands that always gets a descriptive review, that always gets a, <laughs> these coats, this silhouette, this storytelling, rather than thinking, actually, have we seen this before? Actually, mm. can this customer go into Zara right now and create this? Mm. Can they thrift this? Can they do any of this? Um, and it really just doesn't question why. It doesn't question mm. why we're, we're even engaging with something that feels mm. so mundane. But it wouldn't question why, because they're an advertiser. No, exactly. I think <laughs> yeah. that's like the, the, yeah. the funniest thing. It's, there's so many amazing talents in New York. Mm. Um, and seeing head of Vogue, Anna Wintour, front row at Coach, it's like, but why? What, what is this saying about fashion other than it's regurgitating what fashion is right now? Mm. And what a um, base level knowledge of fashion person would consider fashion, mm. but also consumptive. Like you could, anyone would see that jumper and think, oh, that's cute, but because it's a little oversized, it's fashion, mm. right? Mm. I mean, if the whole of New York Fashion Week was like this, nobody would speak about New York Fashion Week. It, it, it's, it kind of can fit in, but only because you've got Kalina Strada, you've got Willy Chavara, you've got mm. these other things that are really strong and, and, and have got really important messages. This can kind of slip in. Um, but yeah, I agree. It's like, which shows do we give uh, importance to and which mm. do we mm. not? I think it's interesting what's really coming up here is thinking about this as one of those kind of bread and butter kind of sellable American brands. Um, like this coach is owned by Tapestry, who also own um, 
What's it called? Stephen Weitzman and um, yeah, Kate Spade. Um, obviously, they brought kind of um, Michael Kors and stuff in. But they were the, they were kind of. I think Tapestry was worth like six billion dollars last year, and this accounted for five billion of those. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Or something like that. Like it's Man. they're they're making the money for mm. Tapestry, not the kind of other little brands. Like they're raking it in. Mm. Um, and I think it's interesting to think about. I think especially kind of off the bat of that Margiela show at the end of Couture, which was, which kind of infiltrated the public imagination. You know, everyone was engaging with this amazing spectacle of theatre. Mm. And then you have something like this. It's kind of like, do we need both to balance each other out? That this is this certain storytelling for the product, mm. and then is fashion storytelling something else? Like, I think also like, how does Fashion Week function? Like. Is it about fantasy and theatre? Is it about selling? Is it about both? Can you have, can both exist in the same world? Is it yeah. okay to be kind of one or the other? I think so. I think as a, as a consumer myself, if I was to think about this as a consumer, like this show to me puts coach accessories into a world where I relate to it somehow. Mm. I think there's a level of it's kind of, you know, the vanilla-ness that you guys talk about. I could about. wear that, you know. I could wear that. You know, I, I relate to some of this collection in a way that potentially I wouldn't have before when it was very heavily leaning into more of a Y2K theme. But also, like you said, that that's what makes it so brilliant and commercial and, and the size of business that it is, is that universality to it. It's kind of like that, <laughs> the Taylor Swift conversation about why she's so popular. And everyone's kind of going, she's so universal. And it's similar to this, mm -hmm. and I'm... I don't know whether or not that necessarily means that it's not cool or cool. I think there's something very cool in, in something being so heavily, heavily popular. Mm. And there's something really interesting what that says about the current kind of state as well, given that it's also sort of a, an affordable luxury brand, mm. you know, quote unquote, but... Um, it's approachable. Yeah, yeah it's, it's approachable. It's, it's yeah. easy to understand. Um, I see references to trends that are happening right now that have been happening for the last year. They aren't new propositions, but they're mm. rooted in conversations we're having with fashion right now. Mm. So the consumer, the editors, anyone will see this and say, coach knows what conversations are going on right now. Mm. And they're engaging with that. Mm. And therefore, they're within the fashion cycle and worth talking about. Because if they weren't, and they were putting out something that everyone collectively agreed was not fashion, they wouldn't be able to sell their bags because nobody would want one. Mm -hmm. Josh, I think it was Josh mentioned something earlier that I thought was interesting about us, that kind of British perspective versus kind of the American sell, sell, sell. And I think it's worth mentioning for people watching at home that Stuart is a British designer yeah. working at an American brand. And it's quite interesting seeing someone from this kind of fashion landscape moving into America and really taking on that mantle of making a global consumer kind of facing brand. Mm -hmm. I think that's worth kind of mentioning and maybe unpacking slightly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think the, yeah, that mix of coming from the UK and obviously really excited about being in New York, you know, 10 years later, so really excited mm -hmm. about being in New York. There's a freshness to it that, that Tommy Hilfiger doesn't have, for example. Mm -hmm. So there, there is an edge, I think, to coach that does feel as if there's a, there's a Britishness yeah. in there. Seeing mm -hmm. America through kind of through, a through foreigner's eyes. eyes. Yeah, and I, I do think that's great. And so we, again, it's sort of relative. So if you look at it against some of the other American, um, more mainstream brands, it does feel more quirky than that. Mm -hmm. um, and going back to what you were saying, I, yeah, that, you're absolutely right, I think that it's really important there's different kinds of things on, on, the, on the runway because otherwise it's being judgmental and saying you have to be that kind of fashion person to be mm. a fashion person. And actually it should be that there's different kinds of fashion people and different kinds of fashion. So, so I retract my <laughs> <laughs> statement about it needing always to be theatre. Um, maybe that's not... But I think that it's, it's I guess, theatre... I guess the point is whether or not theatre always has to mean that it's as spectacular yeah. as a Margiela show, or whether or not this, this is, this is theatre to, you know, 90% of the population. This is mm. already like, you know, if, if anyone who was a coach customer got invited to this show, I'm sure they'd be absolutely over the moon. I think that's, mm. that's the difference yeah. in, in opinion, maybe, that coaches 
coach is targeting that customer and, and appealing to it in a way that feels, like you said, approachable, which I think is mm. successful. Does... I think there's always something so cinematic about Stuart's shows for coach. Mm. And yeah. I don't necessarily know how I feel about it, but when the models walk down the runway, I almost see them as characters, yeah. characters yeah. in I was, a... I kind of wanted to, and I thought this would be a good question for you, Josh, is kind of... You mentioned the idea of archetypes, which is something that Stuart kind of goes back to again and again, that kind of British designer looking at American archetypes. And I wanted to ask, do we think, does that get boring, that, that same theme, or is that consistency interesting? And I guess, Josh, you've kind of answered that in the sense of that you think that there's still a th theatricality to that. Kind yeah. of previous shows, he's done whole sets of kind of the American Southwest, and, you know, he has fun with it. But do we think... Because I think there's always this appetite for newness in fashion, and sometimes that doesn't have to mean complete reinvention every season. But mm. what do we think about that consistency of looking at this idea of American archetypes? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love when a European goes to America and reimagines um, Americana through the really this romantic <laughs> idea of what America is. Because I think when the American designers do it, it's kind of like, OK, blue mm -hmm. jeans and a t-shirt. But when Raph Simmons does it, it's, wow, blue jeans and a t-shirt. That is amazing. <laughs> I think it's defined. It really <laughs> defined, refined. I think the European sensibility is always thinking about cut and fit um, in a way that I, I think American designers, sorry America, struggle with sometimes. Mm. And I think that's what makes like Stewart's approach to coach and to Americana really, really fun to watch. But I don't see necessarily real people. I see mm. characters in a A24 teen dramedy. Right. I think it's really interesting that we've all just said we really enjoy the architects and we think it's really fun. But then when I asked at the beginning, do we think it's cool, it was very like, we don't necessarily think it's a cool brand. So is there a difference between thinking something's necessarily cool and still enjoying it and liking it? What you said about the, the specific garments, I think it's the same with the elements. So the, the big apple, it's fab. You know, it's, <laughs> they have the cherry last year. And then it's, so you, you home in on a particular piece rather than seeing it overall. And I think overall you will say something it's cool or not. Whereas actually with, with coach, you, you go, oh, I really like that yeah. beautiful coat or that fab huge apple on the, on the, on the side of, of a bag. It's great. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's the difference. But going back to what you said about education, I think the, there is something different about a UK fashion education that is irreverent and is kind of uh, taking things to a level that, uh, yes, the, the graduates know, know they need to make a living, but they are being experimental. There's, there's a sense that they're kind of uh, taking something out of, out of one context and putting it in another. I mean, obviously not all uh, students, but I think that thing of, of a UK art school is kind of quite distinctive, and you do see it, I think, in Stuart's work. Mm. I just think it needs to be pushed further in terms of the brand strategy. So he will always do an ode to Americana or a part of American life, but the casting for the show doesn't necessarily reflect mm. that. The front row doesn't necessarily reflect mm. the life that he's honing back on or looking at. And that's where it's not cool and it feels really disjointed because you keep looking at subcultures, but you're not actually involving the people who work mm. with and <clears throat> operate within that subculture. You don't have your eyes on who's in it and experiencing mm. it. And I think that's why it's not cool and that's why heaven works perfectly. Mm. Who would you like to see walking the show? A coach show? Yeah. Hmm. Well, to your point, they should have had someone like Taylor Momsen in it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> For this season. <laughs> For this season. I think the Gossip Girl reboot thing is like a perfect way to think about it. Yeah. I think some of those cars would be... I can't name them because I haven't watched the Gossip Girl reboot. <laughs> I've watched the OG Gossip yeah. Girl, but I think the people that watch the reboot are the prime audience for this. Yeah. And some of that, those cars would be great, kind of... Mm. for this particular season but I think for coach as a whole they just need to start restart with the casting of their campaigns because I'm it's not what do you think me, about the J-Lo the Selena Gomez J-Lo doesn't, doesn't work because to me I look at J-Lo I just think guest and Versace mm. and looking at J-Lo in these campaigns yeah she looks fabulous but 
the mum in the Bronx is not is she buying Coach Bag? I mean, she's not buying it from the store, she's buying it from Macy's. That's who that's appealing mm. to. Then you're telling me that you're into Gen Z. So then we've got Selena Gomez. But does Selena Gomez really match up with Coach? Does she really harken back to this whole ode to New York and America that he loves to represent? I don't think she does. I think the conversation around cool is really funny because none of the people <laughs> that Coach have ever picked are cool. Are cool. I'm sorry to Selena Gomez's fans, but she's not cool. I think she's mm. like the antithesis of cool, and a, many a time I think J Lo is too. Yeah, right. They, it appeals to like the mass she, in a way that isn't. She's an icon though. Like that's the that's the thing about J Lo is that I think that that's I've been trying to figure out why. JLo was the decision they made, and I guess the, o the only link I can make is that she's an icon, and in some respects, the coach bag, and you know, yeah. from Y2K, there's all of that stuff that she harks back to exactly. a time that is. And that kind of yeah. whole Y2K period and the period of kind of the bootleg of coach. Yeah. But also, I think it comes back to where coach sits in the market because mm. you could not, you would not see JLo becoming the face of Chanel. Or Dior, mm, but Versace, maybe Versace. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, she represents that middle point. I think of where Coach sits within mm. the market. Yeah, same same thing as Selena Gomez in a way. Like yeah. she's maybe she's, lower slightly. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, obviously Selena Gomez is like a megastar, um, yeah. and she's so highly kind of like consumed. Mm. Mm. Um, on social media in the same way that, it, I don't know, it, it feels more natural to me, Selena Gomez, than it does with J-Lo. I agree, and yeah. I think actually, I can't remember what year exactly they started working with Selena, but it was around the time that they started really building up their TikTok strategy, and mm -hmm. they've got such a good TikTok strategy, I think, with campaigns, but also mm -hmm. an organic one where people create their own content. You know, they'll review the bags, and they'll talk about it without Coach having to even pay them or do yes. anything. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's interesting that maybe the Selena Gomez thing did work because it started tapping into that kind of really young teenager mm. on TikTok. And Lil Nas X as well. Yeah. That made yeah. sense yeah. for Gen Z, yeah. Yeah. for Y2K yeah. and Gen Z. But yeah. you can imagine people being like, oh, who was the ultimate icon? Lil Nas X, we're going to put him in the yeah. campaign. But then he's actually the campaign for Cotopia. Yeah. So that goes back to that thing that actually maybe that side of it is kind of a bit more on point than the main line. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, I think, yeah, he's, he's great with it. He's perfect for it. Absolutely perfect. Because the Selena Gomez um, imagery, so this is, yeah, the, the actual imagery for her here feels very dated again i don't know what time period Doesn't this it was feel like the kind of magazine ads that yeah. you'd see in like the early 2000s yeah. of a campaign for a brand it kind yeah. of feels like it's harking yeah. back to that yeah it really does doesn't it i've never mm. thought about that you're so right well, we were talking about like i find a disconnect between the runway and everything that happens outside of the runway mm. i couldn't name an iconic fashion forward coach campaign i think mm. they're leaning towards fashion with their runway shows, but post that, where the fashion photographers who are capturing it for the magazines, it feels really like base level fashion photography. Mm. They tried with Jürgen Teller, that campaign. I loved that. That was a really good that, that was with Lil yeah. Nas X, right? That yeah. Was yeah. yeah, and they did, yeah. um, they did a lookbook in lockdown for Fall 19. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, it's funny, because when you look at these images, you very much think of kind of what Loewe have been doing mm. with the Argentella in recent years, and mm. this had such potential to be really cool. Yeah. But I do think maybe it's that the thing about their campaigns and their imagery is that it's the people in it that matter more than whether yeah. it's a great fashion mm. image. Mm. But again, as you know, if I was... I like Selena Gomez, but if I was looking <laughs> at those images as a Selena Gomez fan, I wouldn't resonate with it because it, it doesn't feel like the mm. kind of Selena Gomez that feels popular on social media. There's like a version of the social media star that is so, so popular and successful at what she does. I see what you mean. Um, that isn't really tapping into the same kind of aesthetic. Mm. That Maybe this is chosen. trying to be the grown up version. Yeah. yeah. They're trying to do it. Again, yeah, I don't yeah, know. I'm saying it's dated. It could have been in like 2016. I can't, I actually don't know when it was. <laughs> Nell, if you could kind of wave your magic wand 
Yeah. What would you like to see Coach doing with their kind of communications and strategy? I think that they're doing a lot. I think that's that. It's a difficult um, question to answer, really, because they they're doing so much. You know, they're not a brand that isn't tapping into every single element of new technology that could possibly exist. They are really pushing it forwards. Mm. And I think in the, it's so funny. There's like a subsection of brands like Diesel do this as well. Tommy Hilfiger who are all doing something relating to the metaverse and looking into digital clothing in a really in a real way. Um, they're obviously investing quite heavily into it. They, you know, did their show in Decentraland. And I think that it's interesting because again, I, I'd like to understand the metric of that on the other side of those mm. events, because from my point of view, I think that they, they appear to be doing quite a successful job at, um, at utilizing things like AR to spark more, you know, trying to actually solve real problems like the try-on space, which is what they're trying to do with, with Zero Ten, which I think is really interesting. Um, I think the problem that they've got, which is always the same problem, um, is when they're talking to a customer like Gen Z who have grown up with heavily digital lives. Um, they've also grown up since visual effects has been in place since they've have been born. So the level of um, graphics quality that they expect is far higher than the technology can actually deliver at the moment. So they're doing things that utilize things like phones and you know, um, being able to do something with AR like this. But whether or not it's actually useful in terms of an AR technology to actually feel like it's on your body and you can make a real decision about whether or not you're going to buy a bag, I don't think it's quite there. And so my only, my only question or magic wand that I would possibly wave over them and, and the brand is to look more into how do, we, how do we deliver correct storytelling that feels in line with something that is as, I don't know, visceral, maybe luxury, that they're, ultimately they are a luxury brand. Um, so maybe I would look into more, I would look into more AR technology that can deliver them something on a, on a slightly more high fidelity level. Yeah, more visceral. Yeah. I'd love to hear your thoughts, Ryan. Mm. <laughs> Me, casting. <laughs> casting needs to be sharper. I think photography style in the campaign imagery needs to be stronger. I do think the offline activations are lacking if they're really wanting to engage Gen Z and also Gen Alpha. I think that's the other generation that they can't neglect and abandon, mm. even down to you know a consumer product like the Bomb Bomb Cream by Sol de Janeiro. Mm. They are obsessed with that cream because of mm. the color. So there's an opportunity for them to tap in into that consumer. And I think the best way to do it is to capture their attention with their TikTok strategy, but to do some really fun activations offline. So that's, which may sound like traditional marketing, but I think that's what they really need to stretch and focus mm. their attention on mm. for it to make sense and for him to continue his legacy at Coach before it becomes quite samey, because we're getting there. Mm. We're getting to where it was at Mulberry. Yeah, you said before we started filming that you kind of think Sea Coach as an American Mulberry. Yeah, it is. It is. And we had this great, great shows, great spectacle, great sales. And then it just became a bit samey. And now, you know, Mulberry is trying to shift and redirect and introduce new bags. But I still associate it with John Lewis. <laughs> like, buying it John, as much as I love Mulberry, but, and, but yeah, <laughs> like, I, mean, I won't go we, to the store. Do oh. we think, thinking about Mulberry, mm -hmm. that Coach would benefit from being just a leather goods brand, or do we think it needs the clothes and the story, kind of going back to what we were talking earlier? I, I think it should have both and can have both, but going back to Mulberry and going back to the idea that it is a bags brand, maybe more focus on the bags and what they are and you know who actually is involved in thinking about the design of them even. I mean, we're, we're, we're working with a lot of different designers that are much more about the kind of collective and not the single designer and you know who is it behind all of this and the team that's behind it and what are they thinking and what and we, we work with design teams that start to talk about the the uh, product in terms of their own values and their own lifestyle. So if they're vegan, they're going to be saying, right, I'm not going to work with leather. Mm. Or if they are thinking about something that is really important to them, that could come through in the products, I think, a lot more. 
Um, and, and at the moment, it just seems quite traditional in its approach mm. to thinking about bags. But um, I, I also think that there, there is a chance. They're, they're trying to do quite a few different things. They're doing the, the forever bag so that you can go back and get things repaired. Mm. You're, they're doing Coachtopia. Coach they're doing a few different things. And maybe they need yeah. to think about what is the thing that is really coach. Yeah. Do they want to do resale and, and look at mm. the, the old bags from the 90s? And I don't know. There's just something that doesn't feel as if they've quite worked out what their design approach is. Um, mm that and they can also, be consistent with. Also who they're working with, like Coach is an American dynasty. Connect with another American dynasty, love them or loathe them. I would do something with Kylie Kardashian's brand because that initially started off as like a leather offering. Mm. You're known for being the great American leather brand. Partner mm. up with her because that brand definitely needs some help. That to me yeah. is a gag. I mean, maybe like it would have <laughs> been interesting to see, I know Selena kind of did a collection with them and so yeah. did Lil Nas X, but maybe it's about refining that down and that it's, the tabby bag through J-Lo or the tabby bag yeah. through Selena. Um, before we kind of continue this, I did want to ask you, Dillis, while you were talking there about some of the kind of sustainable values of some of this, because I think it's really interesting how every runway show of coaches, the viral moment is Peta mm. storming the runway, kind of saying, you know, against coach leathers and um, leather kills, here we go, this was last season. Um, and. I think that ties right back into everything we've been talking about, about brand values, speaking to Gen Z, whether those values are kind of held up mm. to the right level. Um, and I wanted to ask you what you think about whether Coach is meeting those kind of, because, you know, they talk about their leathers are treated with natural oils, they're full grain, they offer vegetable dyed leathers, but then you've still got Petter kind of storming the show and saying mm. something's not right here. What mm. do you think about that aspect of the brand? I think that they are doing quite a few things along the surface and actually... Yeah, like Coachtopia and those things you mentioned. Yeah. The, uh, no, leather is, is, the, is the mainstay of their, their business, so they could dig in much deeper and, and think about it all the way through. I mean, in the UK, you've got brands that are working with British Pasture Leather, for example. So if, you, if leather is your thing, then make sure that you've got full integrity right from the soil onwards, and then you talk about that. Mm. Um, or if you decide that actually uh, leather isn't your thing and that you're going to switch like Stella did when she went to the Gucci group, that's a big, bold statement, and you've got to decide that that is the right statement. So I think that they could go in much deeper, and it's not surprising that Pet is going, well, you didn't reply to us from last season. <laughs> yeah, you've got to, you know, you're telling us a little bit about something, but we, you've, the coach has got the opportunity to be able to prove that what they're doing actually has integrity because, you know, there's, there's, the problem isn't necessarily a material. The problem is exploitation and extraction. And if you're showing that what you're doing is regenerative to the soil, that you're using something that actually has a positive overall effect, mm. then, then there's, there's nothing to, to say that you're not doing something with credibility. If you're not actually saying that, but you're saying, oh, we're doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that, Petter's going to keep coming back to you. So you, mm. you, you've got to come back with a better argument. Yeah. It feels like we all feel like there's a lot going on in terms of strategy and hitting all the right points, but maybe not all of them are being met to the right depth. Yeah. It feels like there's a strength in everything that you're saying about, like there's strength in singularity. And I think maybe that's what coach should be thinking about is how do they hone in on something that they're really, really brilliant at? Um, and then follow through with that integrity and also, you know, authenticity is that like overused word, but it is something that happens with Gen C, you know, they really respond well to a brand that follows through with what they're going to say, what they say and what they do need to match up. And I think from a brand that is so heavily, heavily diversified, maybe it is just that they need to do less so they can actually make those things um, yeah. follow through in a way that they're, they're not. Josh, do you think Coach has integrity in terms of its messaging <laughs> and image? Um, no. I don't know. I think I agree that they've kind of thrown their eggs all over the place rather than really refined. Like, could I define the Coach girl right now mm -hmm. based on Stuart's tenure? Um, I go back to this idea of costume and character every season is, is a new idea, a new aesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's that line connecting it mm -hmm. altogether as one <clears throat> fully-fledged individual. 
which I think maybe speaks to the demographic that Coach is really targeting. It's, it's younger, it's someone who's discovering new things all the time, whose knowledge and references are growing rather than set. Mm. What would you like to see more from Coach in terms of kind of how they communicate? All the people kind of they have as ambassadors? I think that for me it's the disconnect between the runway show, which again is very fashion leaning, and then all of the imagery I see outside of that. The imagery I see outside of that feels mm. paint by numbers commercial, um, paint by numbers social strategy based to get as many eyes on it as possible, rather than expanding on the world building of the these cinematic shows. Mm. Um, yeah, I think it's that disconnect. I would love for them to hone in on, on it and create a full 360 experience. Mm. Do we think this has longevity for the next 10 years under Stuart? Because I think we've defined a very clear kind of strategy and messaging for this show and kind of how that reflects the previous 10 years, but do we think that has longevity? Kind of closing thoughts? I think it's... I think it's starting to lack a little. I think those early years with Stuart, I found very exciting. And maybe it was because, for me, my whole adolescence coach was like a NAF brand based on their monogram wristlets. And here was a designer making something and really engaging with the fashion conversations at the moment. And even if it wasn't provocative or boundary pushing, it felt fresh for them. It felt fresh for an American brand at this market and mm -hmm. for this demographic. Um, within these 10 years, I think it's starting to wane a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the consumer is a lot more savvy. I think the demographic he's targeting should be a lot more savvy in what they're seeing. I, I think they should see something and be inspired by it and want to learn more about the inspirations that went behind this or whatever, and actually what they're being met with with Coach right now is here's J-Lo sporting the latest bag that she probably wouldn't buy herself if she went into a Coach store. It feels too targeted, mm. wallet targeted. <laughs> <laughs> now, what do you think? Um... No, I, I feel like there's, there's sort of at the beginnings. I know that this, this feels disjointed. I completely agree with. I find this video to stuff. This, this, this feels. This doesn't necessarily feel right for the customer. Um, so I, I don't know. I think that feels like there's like. It's funny because it, it feels like there's a beginning of something to me, with the way that the tabby bag's being communicated and the way that I see. You know, that bag in particular being something that's been picked up and could probably live on for many, many years mm. in the way that they're communicating it. But it's just everything else around it. If all of those elements that we've all spoken about sort of fall into place, and there seems to be more kind of um, continuity with the messaging, then sure, why not? I mean, it's, it's heavily, heavily commercial. They're obviously doing very well, very well off their leather goods in particular. So it almost feels like they're sort of figuring out everything else out around it and it doesn't actually matter mm. that much at the moment. So why not? <laughs> Dennis, what do you think? Closing thoughts? Um, I mean, I think everything's created by a team. Mm. And I do think that Stuart, uh, not that I know him, but he has integrity from the things I've heard about the fact that he isn't precious, he's open, he's collaborative. So I think he's got the... Uh, capabilities of being able to lead a team mm. and listen and be able to evolve something. So I think that actually is really important, whether it'll actually happen or not, um, and who is actually breathing down whose neck. In mm. <laughs> I think that is something it's... refreshing about coaches. It has an openness mm. yeah. to it that seems to come, has to come from somewhere and mm. comes from Stuart. Yeah. And that I think we're not necessarily used to from a lot of luxury brands. Yeah. So that's quite, actually quite, cool. quite a nice thing. Quite cool. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Um, 
it's waning for us, I think, as fashion consumers and as lovers of fashion. As long as he's still hitting those numbers and he's accounting for five billion, if not more, he's going to stay. He's, yeah. As long as he's selling, <laughs> he's selling those bags. So I don't, for us, it will be disappointing because we want to see this American dynasty, you know, be commercial, push the boundaries, have a level of theatre. But as long as he's hitting those numbers for the CEOs and everybody on the board, I don't care. <laughs> It's as simple as that. It's the business of fashion, really. <laughs> it is the business of fashion. Yeah. <laughs> Without great design and with yeah. good teams, you can't, you've got nothing to sell. Yeah, yeah. So continue with those teams and sell in the bags. Keep on selling. Mm. <laughs> Thank you guys so well, much for not. joining me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining me and thank you for joining at home and like, comment, subscribe and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.